I am not a big fan of keto. I do see a lot of, um, I, I can't even say a lot. I do see some women who benefit from keto or, you know, you read this online. These are not my clients, but they'll do keto for three months. And then all of a sudden it stops working and they regain all the weight because your adrenals tank, you don't have enough carbs to support the conversion of T4 to T3, which is the active form of thyroid hormone. So long-term, it's great short-term, but long-term you really want to have carbs in your diet. And as someone who has a very loving romantic relationship with carbs, I like to teach women. <laughs> I mean, like I, I am a, a I don't know if I'm a, a committed carbo side per se. I'm very judicious with my carbs, but teaching women on the right kinds of carbs. So swapping out bagels for, you know, sweet potatoes or breakfast cereal for, uh, you know, a bowl of eggs with some fresh fruit, um, having some flax or chia pudding with that, which can actually help bind excess estrogen. If you're estrogen dominant, pull it out. Um, you know, really swapping out for whole food carbs, for quinoa, legumes, if you tolerate them, um, uh, rice, um, what am I missing? Squash. My, squash, thank you. Butternut winter squash. <laughs> thank you. Uh, all of those and fruit and complex vegetables, you know, leafy greens, all of those are wonderful. So not only that, but I do like women to have carbs before bed, which goes against a lot of what we were taught. And the thing is this, you're not sleeping so well right now. So that nice bump in insulin from your dinnertime carbs is going to blunt the effect of cortisol as your insulin comes up. This means that you sleep better. You're not waking up totally wide awake with your mind racing, you're drenched in sweat. You know, if you can override that piece with your diet and kind of do a lot of protein by day and carbs at night. And I'm talking at least a cup, cup and a half. You really are going to sleep well. You'll feel good. You won't feel carb depleted. Oh my goodness. Esther, thank you so much for being on the Root Cause Medicine podcast. Thank you for having me, Carrie. I'm so, so, so excited to hang out with you. Well, I don't think the listeners know this, but I have known, I had known you, I fangirled you for years and years and years, years ago with one of your first books, a patient gave it to me for Christmas. And she was like, do you know this author? I mean, this is years, this is probably your first book. And I was like, oh, she's amazing. And then the next, your, your next book came out and she gave me that book for Christmas as well. So I just started, and then I met you on social media and here we are. Oh my goodness, I'm blushing. <laughs> I am blushing right now. First of all, please thank your, your patient. And you've never told me this story. I know. So, wow. Thank you. Yes. You just made my day. Cause I, I know when I, when we were talking about getting on this podcast, I told my husband, I was like, I'm going on my girl crushes podcast. Like I was so, so, so excited. So and here, that's how and I feel about you. Here we are. Dreams do come true. Yes, they do. Well, for the people who don't know you or know anything about your books, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, your background, what you stand for, and we'll dive yeah, in. Yeah, what I stand for. Well, that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> All right. But um, I am very much, you know, I'm very much the reality Barbie when it comes to eating. I am a clinically trained dietitian. I come from a family of doctors and, uh, my grandfather took my tonsils out himself in his OR in his house in Brooklyn. That's a whole nother story, but <laughs> wow. so and my dad was like an amazing doctor. My mom was a nurse. So yeah, a whole line of healers. Um, but I very much believe your body is a temple, but who can't, who says it can't be a nightclub? Like I am just martini in one hand and wheatgrass in the other. So that's kind of how I approach my eating, my work with my clients is just to be as relaxed about food as possible, but really empower people to take control of them, their health, to be self-advocates, to test and not guess, and really get to the root cause of their health issues. Because, um, you know, I, I worked in hospitals for so many years, for at least five, the first five years of my career, and worked in cardiology units and was like literally giving people five minutes, 10 at most of diet instruction after they had a heart attack, sending them home, never saw them again. So that wasn't really helpful. And then I slowly, um, I left the hospital. I worked for a functional, I got trained in functional medicine, worked for a functional medicine doctor, and then went out on my own. And 
over the years, the longer I do this carry, the more I see the rampant medical gaslighting and hear like horror stories with what medicine is now. We're in this really strange place where like med school curriculums have not been updated, but functional medicine treatments are really on the cutting edge of absolute elite treatments, but not everyone affords functional medicine. So this is why I started writing my books to kind of be able to give people to really literally open the kimono on my practice and say, here's a free, here's a consultation in a $15 book, basically. And here's how to advocate for your health. What tests do you need? How, you know, how are you going to solve your imbalances? Instead of going to a doctor and just hearing, you know, it's all in your head or, um, this morning I talked to a client who's, who was clearly hypothyroid and her doctor said, go see a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist said, you're clearly hypothyroid, go to an endocrinologist. So <laughs> it's like, I'm just, I'm really fed up with, you know, people having to suffer needlessly. So that's kind of what I stand for is just, this is a gaslight free zone. I really make it my mission to just give people the tools they need to get better. Amen to that. <laughs> Amen to that. And I love to going back. I was when you said the the um, the cutting edge part of functional medicine. I was just at or online the um, Institute for Functional Medicine's conference was this past weekend, and one of the speakers was talking about a topic, and he said, "You know, this isn't mainstream and conventional medicine, but at this point, there's so much literature being published about it now. It needs to be, and it's really frustrating when." I get pushback. This is the speaker talking. He said, I get pushback that, you know, there's, there's no literature on that. And he's like, actually there's copious amounts of research on it. It's, it's in mainstream journals too. Like, what are you reading? And I thought, yes, yes. I, the gaslighting, even between practitioners, let alone the, your practitioner and the patient is just as huge. And when, when somebody says that doesn't exist or that's not true. And it's like, well, actually, if you just do a quick little search, you're going to find Google Scholar, PubMed, whatever you're looking up to date, which are all websites we use, um, you'll find a lot. And so I am so glad to have you on because gaslight free zone, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, you know, even as a, a traditionally trained dietitian, I have a bachelor's and a master's. And when I went and took my functional medicine course, I was handed a manual of studies this thick with all the research to support the supplements we use, the protocols I was taught. And I was furious because I was so in debt. It took me 10 years to pay off my student loans. And I was like, I didn't learn any of this mm -hmm. at all after mm -hmm. all. And what I learned in four months was like, it just absolutely revolutionized my practice. So very grateful to have the knowledge now. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, never look back, but it is fascinating to see the gap. That's the truth. Well, speaking of the gap, we're going to talk about now the gap as you transition from cycling years into your perimenopause and menopausal years, because that is a pet project of yours with a new book coming out here soon. And I get a lot of questions, as you do, around perimenopause and menopause. And going back to our whole ga no gaslighting theme, a big question <laughs> I get, and I want your opinion, is why aren't we taught about perimenopause and menopause? Mm. Like, why is it this big secret for women? just high level in general, how many of your, your, your clients have come to you and said, what is happening to my body? What is this change? And why is nobody talking about it? Yeah, it's, um, it's fascinating when I was researching. So the name of my book, it's, it's called see you later ovulator it's mastering menopause through nutrition, hormones, and self-advocacy. Um, and when I was doing the research, I saw all the flawed research and, um, there is so much scare. Uh, there are so many scare tactics around using hormones. There's a couple of levels to this question, okay? So first is hormones cause cancer. That is the message that has been the message. The North American Menopause Society actually revised this statement in 2018 and said, oopsie, the data was not analyzed correctly. The data was not correct. And by the way, the hormones that were being used in the research for postmenopausal replenishment therapy was 
used with, from the urine or derived from the urine of pregnant horses. That is not exactly biocompatible with a female human's body, right? So, but nevertheless, the research is showing that hormone replenishment therapy is safe, it's effective, and it's safe for long-term use. But a lot of doctors don't have it. I list, I have so many studies. I have six or seven pages, single spaced of studies in this book that show that not only is it safe, not only is it effective, but it helps prevent the onset of chronic degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, heart disease, and osteoporosis. So um, the unfortunate part is that a lot of doctor's offices have not updated their pamphlets in their office to reflect this, number one. Number two, a lot of doctors believe that the prescription of hormones is an off-label use and they won't touch it, right? So here's the thing about that. Let's talk about what's off-label use. Prescribing Prilosec for more than 14 days, which is a, a stomach acid blocker that prevents reflux, for those of you who don't know. Um, and yet people, doctors say, you can take it forever, right? I watched my father's spine crumble and watched him bent in half from these drugs. And he was a doctor. And I'd always say, get off that stuff. Um, but he did not. So I can tell you firsthand the damage that off-label use of medications does. The pill is actually, and uh, taking the pill constantly without ever getting the period to my, you can correct me here, Carrie, but the best of my news, knowledge is also an off-label use of this medication. So doctors will put you on the pill when you're a teenager having irregular periods. Then they'll tell you to take it all the way until you have a baby. Then, which suppresses your uh, progesterone production and your normal hormone production, then you'll be put on an IUD after you have a baby because you don't remember to take the pill all the time. But no doctors want to put you on hormones after your period stops. So therein lies a philosophical conflict of interest, if you ask me. Um, and then the third thing is that it's not taught in medical school. The medical school curriculum is not up to date on women's health. And Women's health has historically had very poor representation in research studies. Um, when I was writing Cave Women Don't Get Fat, I looked at 73 studies on intermittent fasting, 13 were done on women. Um, it's just they're done on rats and they're done on men. So we really have to start changing that. I mean, you well, we have two choices, right? We can either fight our doctors, our current doctors, or we can just work with a functional medicine doctor and move on with our life and not waste our time. But it it is a shame because in the process, we're getting horribly gaslit. And, you know, my clients do go to doctors saying, wow, I'm having hot flashes and insomnia and my libido stinks and I've gained like 10 pounds. And they're like, well, that's just menopause. And no one is starting the discussion on the fact that you can start taking very low doses of bioidentical hormone in the perimenopausal process. So that is why I wrote this book to kind of get the information out there, which is backed by research and science and is legit. And we need it. Even our pharmacies, if anyone's ever picked up a prescription at the pharmacy, remotely related to hormones, you get about eight printed out pages of information about the Women's Health Initiative study and how it's going to give you cancer. So take it at your own risk. I mean, I would have patients that will call me hysterical. Oh my gosh, my pharmacist printed this thing out and says I'm going to get cancer be you know, because of this study that so much controversy around it. Oh my gosh, even our pharmacies, our conventional pharmacies mm. are not up to date in 2021, 2022 with what's that with, with the, what our literature is showing us. And that's so frustrating mm -hmm. as a patient when you're trying to advocate for yourself and just do what you hope is what's best for you. And then you're yes. getting outdated information. Yes, and then you get your doctors refusing to treat you or help you and are just told you to go home and wait it out for the next five to 10 years, which is not okay. Right, right. You mentioned a few of the symptoms of perimenopause, menopause. Can you go into that? Like what... So if somebody's listening, like what's the typical age? What symptoms should they be looking for? How do they know that this podcast is for them? This book is for them? Yeah. So um, 
perimenopause usually starts somewhere in your mid 40s. The, the average age for menopause is 50 and menopause is the period of time when you've gone 12 months consecutively without a period. So if you're a starter and a stopper, like you miss a period, you get a period, then six months go by, then you get another period, you do have to start the clock all over again. So I'm so sorry about that. But um, but once you've gone a solid 12 months without a period, you do um, you are menopausal. For those of you who are not aware, you still need birth control, okay? Even if you're not really ovulating, as my, my mom was a postpartum nurse and she used to say all it takes is one drop <laughs> so make sure <laughs> that you're using some kind of birth control there um so perimenopause usually starts in the 40s however there are many of you listening who may have gone through it in your late 20s in throughout your 30s there is really um you know i've seen it all over the map so it, you can also look at when your mom had uh, went through menopause, although, you know, my mom, she had a surgical hysterectomy when she was 46. So I have no idea when she went through, but the signs and symptoms can be, you notice that your sleep is um, less robust, less deep. You're waking up more. You wake up at three, you can't fall back asleep. Um, there's an, there can be an uptick in anxiety and or depression. You can have changes in your thyroid function you may notice you have an increase of food intolerances and all of a sudden have this bloating happening uh more irritability uh also like you're more hot at night you notice hey i'm you may not be hot flashing but you're like wow i need a fan on me now or i i throw off my blankets or i can't i can only sleep in a tank top now <laughs> that's you <laughs> and then you may miss a period. you're like check 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 and you may miss periods here and there so you kind of like back i think it was you carrie who said you back out of menstruation the way you went in was that yeah, you were reverse, puberty. Place? reverse puberty reverse puberty yes 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 which i thought was such a great analogy for it so those can be your symptoms of perimenopause absolutely my i'll be 45 and uh this year and our upstairs bedroom for whatever reason hvac issues is warmer than the rest of the house and every night when i wake up warm or hot in the morning i'll look at my husband and go was it hot was it hot last night was it were you hot too <laughs> were you also hot I and mean, he's you know he'll be like oh yeah it was really warm last night i'm like okay for you. <laughs> <laughs> is it me or is it the room i'm constantly yeah. checking. is it me or yes. is it the room it's the game that i play uh as we get into the warmer the warmer months and warmer seasons and do you notice the second half of your cycle is different than the first or is it kind of oh, consistent yeah. throughout? Oh, no, definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. And I hear when I was in my 30s, I had patients who were older than me say, you just wait, wait oh. until you hit 45 and your sleep stops and you put on 10 pounds, you know, and, and, and. And I was like, no way, that won't happen to me. And when <laughs> I hit my 40s, I want to say at like 43 I realized my sleep wasn't as good. Now it's better. I've made a lot of adjustments um, because yeah. I didn't have a choice. Um, but the other interesting thing is I used to have a memory that was super sharp and um, could remember anything. And I didn't really need to make lists if I didn't need to. And now I definitely find myself, especially when my stress is higher, um, where I'll go, what was I just going to do? What? Why did I just open that tab? Why did I just pick up this pen? Like, what was I looking for? <laughs> and I have to stop and think. And as a girlfriend of mine was like, well, maybe you multitask too much, which is true. But at the same time, I never used to have that problem. I could multitask and stay on track. And now I find I have to slow down, not multitask as much because that, um, and make more lists. And I was told that too. I would have patients in their forties say to me, you just wait, you just wait. You're going to start making all sorts of lists. And I was like, no. <laughs> Yeah, they were right. <laughs> Brain help. Brain well, help. and yeah, I mean, when you're not sleeping as much, hello, of course. And I always get the dropsies too when I'm PMS. I totally will like drop things all and like just be very clumsy too, which, and that happened to me in pregnancy too. So it's interesting. Progesterone. Um, and that's so funny. So I, I do some work with athletes and uh, progesterone changes our saltwater balance. So it changes kind of like our proprioception in space. And so what can happen is, and me especially, as I get close to my period, 
um, I break glasses. I'm not allowed to have nice glassware because <laughs> I've managed to break all of them. And so uh, oh. my, if I break something, my husband's always like, is your period due soon? I'm like, sure is. <laughs> <laughs> and what's interesting is I posted on this on social media not long ago and the amount of women that wrote in the in the comments and the dms who said oh that's me i drop everything i trip i run into walls i'm not as graceful i you know i can't have nice glassware either um was really pretty eye-opening so i we're not alone yes, yes you're not alone at all <laughs> not at all not alone no so with you, if somebody comes to see you and they, they are in their forties or fifties and they're reporting a lot of these symptoms, where do you even start? Where do you start when somebody comes in SOSing? Yeah. So I test, I do not guess. Um, I run extensive blood work and especially an extensive thyroid hormone panel. You know, TSH is a very poor excuse for a comprehensive thyroid panel. And yet it's what a lot of doctors rely on. Uh, so you really have to do about six or seven different thyroid tests uh, in the blood. And I look at also metabolic markers. I look at inflammatory markers, cardiac risk factors, um, and B vitamins, magnesium, zinc. I really try and make sure, and ferritin levels, make sure that the whole picture is comprehensive when it comes to blood work. And I also do two tests that are done at home. One is a stool test called the GI map. One is a Dutch test, which is a dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. Hello, Carrie Jones, the queen of the Dutch <laughs> My <test>. alma mater. <laughs> Your alma mater. What did I say? I love it. I love it. I love it. And yeah, I mean, you and your team really trained me beautifully on using it. Um, and so what I do is, yeah, I run these tests because I want to look at your gut function. I want to see if you have any stealth infections or parasites or pathogens, or if you have dysbiosis, a leaky gut, a gluten sensitivity, or if you are um, excreting your estrogen properly or reabsorbing it into the gut. Because if your gut function is off and you want to start hormone replenish replenishment, trust me, you are not going to feel well. You're mm -hmm. constipated and you're not pooping every day. You're not excreting your hormones. I always say hormones, I liken them to kind of just a nicely moving stream or a gentle moving river, but it should not be like a stagnant pond where they're just sitting and not moving through your liver, through all the phases of detoxification, which you can speak to the biochemistry on a much more elaborate level. I try <laughs> to just keep it basic. But yeah, so I do stool testing um, and, you know, constipation is one of the most frequently uh, solvable problems that I treat in practice. It really so much is diet and lifestyle, and sometimes it's digestive enzymes. Sometimes there are structural issues, but I really solve constipation, even in people with torturous colons. So wow. you really can get to it. It takes some, some time and patience, but you can do it. Um, and then I do the Dutch test because I want to look at, you know, how hormones are moving through your body. Are they going down the right pathways? It's, it's really a good assessment to see if you are a candidate for hormone replenishment or not. Do you have a fatty liver? Do you have some blood sugar imbalances? What's your cortisol like? Because that's also going to tell me, you know, hey, I see that you've been doing a lot of spin classes and that's really great for your heart, but not so much for your sleep right now. And perhaps you should do either shorter, more intense duration workouts, or you can also just get into more restorative workouts, like tons of walking and some yoga and weights two to three times a week. And oh my gosh, your energy and your sleep are going to come back and you're going to put on muscle and get lean. So I look at that. And then also, of course, I look at the neurotransmitters in your brain. I do the Dutch complete, um, which has an organic acids test. Cause again, I want to see if you're low in melatonin, what's your dopamine serotonin production like. So really it's getting your brain happy. It's getting your, your stomach, your uh, intestinal tract happy, which will help your brain function better. And then it's getting your liver happy so that hormones come in, they can go out and then you start to get your quality of life back. You know, I have um, a client that was having horrible, horrible hot flashes. And we just, she had so many gut issues. I said, I'm not even going to treat your hormones yet. We cleaned up her gut and it was like, they all went away. And I didn't put her on any supplements to treat her hormones at all. I put her on probiotics, 
digestive enzymes and whatever else her gut needed. So you really, it's, it's really profound how these changes affect you and hormones. Although I'm a huge, huge fan, if you don't, fix your body and the big rocks of your metabolism and health, you're going to be in trouble. You're actually going to feel worse and it's not going to be a great use of your time and resource. Like I always say, you can't out hormone your lifestyle. You can't out supplement your lifestyle. You've got to, if you're reading your, on your tablet till 1130 and your sleep is really poor, you know, it's all going to go downhill from there. So I do get my people to meditate, to actually make the room a screen free zone to, or meditate with a, an app and then put it away, you know, just the basics, right? Like unplugging, un deleting your social media apps on the weekends, you know, just really getting back to the basics. And which, it's, which is what it's all about. I mean, I, we're going to, we're, I'm going to go deep into some of these things you've said, because yeah. I, I know there's gonna be a lot of questions around what was that test again? And what am I looking for? <laughs> but I, over and over and over, I'm asked, I know you're asked as we're talking about this. Yeah. People go, oh crap. It's just the basics, isn't it? I'm like, it is, it is, you know, every, I know, I understand, trust me, we live in a busy world. We have families and jobs and kids and uh, the world is stressful. And we're just hoping for the magic supplement. So while supplements can be great, they can be a nice band aid, they can be helpful. Um, man, you nailed it on the head. You can't out hormone yourself. You can't supplement <laughs> yourself, you know, if you're not taking care of the basics. And I was just, um, talking to this big, uh, meditation coach last week and she, we were part of a panel and somebody said to her, Oh God, I'm afraid to ask how long do you meditate? And she said, 10 minutes, I meditate 10 minutes a day. And we were expecting hours. They were like, like, <laughs> like Gandhi himself, you know, we're like, Oh gee, she's like, no, I have 10 minutes. I run a business. I do this. I do that. I do this. I do that. And she said, I do 10 minutes and it's life-changing for me. And I thought, oh, that's what I do. I only do 10 minutes. Like, look at me. <laughs> I do what the meditation coach does. This is great. So, it and I, I think that can be really um, freeing for a lot of women who think, are you kidding? Look at my schedule. There's no, there's no way I could squeeze some of this stuff in. And um, even just two minutes of breathing exercises, you know, just two minutes, quick breathing exercise, or before you, as you get into bed at night, lay in bed, do two minutes of breathing exercises and then fall asleep. And it's these little things um, that, you know, as you, and you talk about in your book that add up over time and make that a huge was, difference. Yeah, totally. I mean, that I, I put myself on, it's interesting because I'm actually, as we record this podcast, I'm being treated for mold and Lyme, which uh, talk about brain fog. Hello. Like yeah. totally got my brain function back. Amen. But, um, you know, I, I started, my doctor ran a meditation challenge, which I thought was amazing. And he was like, the way to heal is, this is Tom Moorcroft for anyone yeah. who, please, the best human, he's chronically happy. <laughs> he's so amazing. And he was like, the best way to heal is to meditate and see yourself as if it's already way behind you. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. So I listened to this guy on Insight Timer, David G, J I. Yeah. Yeah. He is also like, oh, he is so rad. And he has this meditation called Deep Healing. And he's like, all you need to do, right, is 56 days, that's eight weeks, that's less than two months to change the shape of your brain, to change that fight or flight center, right? And his meditation for you people, it's, it's 22 minutes. I barely make it to the end. I usually fall asleep. But honestly, I have missed two days in, I'm probably on month 10 now. And oh my God, it just, it re changes how you respond to stress. It like helps you think more clearly. You're more organized, you know, it just lowers your cortisol. But for people who only want to do it 10 minutes, it's all you need. 10 minutes is all you need to lower your cortisol. And I use Insight Timer too. It's on, and I've no, I, I don't have any affiliation or anything with yeah, Insight same. Timer. I just love that it's... Um, Literally, you can time. So if I only have five minutes, I do five minutes. And if I have a little longer, I'm feeling longer, then I set the timer. I can, you know, you can search. You can search by time. Guided, not guided, music. And so it's really a nice app for that reason. So say that, say his name again for people. David G, it's J-I, and it's the deep healing meditation. And it's free, guys. There's no yeah, cost that's the best. So breathing yeah. is free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to go back to the labs because I know um, some women listening are going, 
the most I get at a lab work, you know, I go in for my physical and I'll get a cholesterol and, you know, maybe a red and white blood cell and a glucose and a pap. And that, <laughs> like, that's all I get. Can you just t- touch a little deeper on like thyroid? When you are advocating for yourself, what do you want people to ask for when they want a full thyroid panel? Yes. So, okay. And this is where I'm going to need you to step in. Cause I never remember all the names of the test, <laughs> but I'll be full disclosure and say, I give my clients a written list and I list them out in the book too. Um, but definitely, of course you want a TSH, you want a reverse T3, a T4, mm-hmm. a TPO, which is thyroid peroxidase, peroxidase, TG antibodies. I list as TGAB. That's thyroid. what I do. Yeah. Everyone does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then T3, is, T3, yep. I said TSH. TSH is the main one. That's thyroid stimulating hormone. I bet a lot of women have had that at least once in their life. Maybe if they've been pregnant, they probably had a screening TSH, but um, as you can just listening to this list, I mean, the thyroid, a thyroid workup is a way more than screening. And as, as a, a thyroid friend of mine has said, um, when you look at all of these numbers, it's like looking at like touching different areas of an elephant. So in conventional, in traditional mm-hmm. medicine, you get a TSH and they're like, well, it's not high. Ergo, your entire thyroid system is fine. It's like, no, no, there's a lot of compensatory mechanisms to keep that fine, but everything else is going haywire. So this is why you want to touch every part of the elephant. So in the end you can go, oh yeah, that's an elephant versus just, yes. you know, like, <clears throat> what, and is you, what is that? That's right. I'm sorry to cut you off. Nope, that's, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but also, you know, I've unearthed numerous cases of Hashimoto's in my practice just by checking antibodies, not yes. because not because the symptoms were there, but because somebody's saying, I'm not feeling right, I've got this and that, but they weren't necessarily thyroid symptoms. They were having a lot of gut issues. And um, there are also certain bacteria in the gut, and don't ask me to name them without looking them up, but there are certain bacteria in the gut that also correlate with autoimmune conditions and yeah. Hashimoto's. And if they're low, you can often be more prone to Hashimoto's. Yes. So yes. yeah, you just, you have to do these tests. I even had Tom run, you know, he's checking my hormones recently. I was like, throw in another thyroid panel, please. He was like, sure. So, uh, you know, I just, I test religiously because in menopause, thyroid and perimenopause, your thyroid can really change. And a lot of women start taking thyroid medication after pregnancy and through menopause. Yeah. It's these big transitions that us women go through. So puberty, pregnancy, postpartum, perimenopause and menopause. And that's when our hormone systems can crash or can really alter. And so it's not one and done. It's not like, well, I had my thyroid checked two years ago. I'm fine. But now as you're further along into menopause or perimenopause, it's entirely possible. Just like you said, things are crashing and burning. So keep a periodic check on it. Don't just assume it's one and done. That's right. And also, you know, when you go through menopause, basically the primary site of your hormone production, which is your ovaries, flips and kind of migrates over to your adrenals. Your ovaries are like, good night now. I'm going to sleep. I think you did, you did a hilarious sleeping beauty or you were wearing like a pink hoodie. Yes. And the tiara and the, and the voice you were lip syncing. Goodbye. Like, Goodbye now. <laughs> never, no, never. Yeah. My period's never coming back. <laughs> never. Oh, bye. Maybe. Bye. <laughs> and like, and yeah, so your, so your adrenals really take the brunt of, um, you know, the rest of your hormone production. Well, you do need healthy adrenals to also support your thyroid function. So, you know, if you're in a chronically stressed out state, and this is the time of life when we may have teenagers, which I think is nature's cruel trick. I'm like, you made us have teenagers while going through menopause. Like I said to my husband, you should probably move out for about 10 more years. <laughs> you'll be good. Come back in. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so, you know, you have teenagers and often aging parents at the same time. And you're, we're usually in the height of our careers, like the forties and fifties is when it really peaks, especially for women. We're really coming into our own now. So, um, or we're becoming empty nesters and are trying to figure out like, how do I, you know, what's next for me? So your adrenals are understandably under a lot of wear and tear. So you've got to make sure that that's supported. So your thyroid's really healthy too. And one of the other big symptoms I want to touch on, because it's, it's a huge one that I get asked is the weight gain of perimenopause and menopause. And I want to bring it up from a, um, 
because you mentioned like blood sugar markers, inflammatory markers, you know, long-term risk. And so with that, the weight gain of perimenopause and menopause it isn't always what we call metabolically healthy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to increase our blood sugar insulin. It's going to increase in these inflammatory little hormones that we have running around. Um, women often report to me, I didn't change anything. I didn't change my diet. I didn't change my exercise. And yet I'm 15 pounds heavier. I don't like it. I feel more sluggish. I feel more blah. What is going on there? And what do you do as a highly trained registered dietitian? Like, what do you do with this? Yeah. So what happens is, you know, I always say, if you didn't have a muffin top before you can have one now, or your muffin top turns into a cake top. So yes, as your estrogen and progesterone decline, um, your cortisol can come up and your insulin receptors become less receptive to insulin. There is a fantastic research study I talk about a lot. I saw it years ago um, where there were two groups, two control groups of type two diabetics. One group took metformin and did not lose weight. And the other group did not take metformin um, and did weightlifting instead. And the group that did the weightlifting without menformin had better blood glucose control because lifting weights and challenging your muscle. And if you're not lifting weights, you know, using bands, resistance, body weight, any of that, anything that's going to stress your muscle, but ideally at some point, yes, some weight would be wonderful. Um, That is going to drive insulin into your cells. Okay. And so, and I couple that with changing your carb picture. I am not a big fan of keto. I do see a lot of, um, I I can't even say a lot. I do see some women who benefit from keto or, you know, you read this online. These are not my clients, but they'll do keto for three months. And then all of a sudden it stops working and they regain all the weight because your adrenals tank, you don't have enough carbs to support the conversion of T4 to T3, which is the active form of thyroid hormone. So long-term it's great short-term, but long-term you really want to have carbs in your diet. And as someone who has a very loving romantic relationship with carbs, I like to teach women. I mean, like I sleep, I am a, a, I don't know if I'm a, a committed carbo side per se. I'm very judicious with my carbs, but teaching women on the right kinds of carbs. So swapping out bagels for, you know, sweet potatoes or breakfast cereal for, uh, you know, a bowl of eggs with some fresh fruit, um, having some flax or chia pudding with that, which can actually help bind excess estrogen. If you're estrogen dominant, pull it out. Um, You know, really swapping out for whole food carbs, for quinoa, legumes, if you tolerate them, um, uh, rice, what am I missing? Squash. My, squash. Thank you. Butternut winter squash. <laughs> thank you. Uh, all of those and fruit and complex vegetables, you know, leafy greens, all of those are wonderful. So not only that, but I do like women to have carbs before bed, which goes against a lot of what we were taught. And the thing is this, you're not sleeping so well right now. So that nice bump in insulin from your dinner time carbs is going to blunt the effect of cortisol as your insulin comes up. This means that you sleep better. You're not waking up totally wide awake with your mind racing. You're drenched in sweat. You know, if you can override that piece with your diet and kind of do a lot of protein by day and carbs at night, and I'm talking at least a cup, cup and a half, you really are going to sleep well. You'll feel good. You won't feel carb depleted. The other option is to time your carbs around your workouts. Um, I know, you know, uh, when I lift really heavy, I actually have a couple spoons of honey with some salt on it or, you know, a banana with honey to really bump up my insulin and shut off that cortisol. So I'm not in this like hyper adrenal state. Um, But there are wonderful, you have a couple other options too. One is there are wonderful herbs to help kind of give your progesterone that last nice bump, kind of that last appearance at the party. Um, Chase tree is wonderful. That really, or Vitex, that helps get progesterone up. Um, You can do some black cohosh to help with hot flashes and some borage oil or vitamin E, and that will enable you to sleep better, which will also correct some of that belly insulin resistance. Um, And then if you're a candidate, I do 
have women either put on topical progesterone cream, or if their progesterone's really rock bomb, we start them on oral progesterone trochies. And a trochee is like a, a waxy oral tablet that dissolves in your mouth, bypasses the liver. Um, so it's absorbed really quickly. Uh, if you want to get it at the pharmacy and covered by insurance, um, Prometrium is a, a good oral progesterone. It does have to go through your digestive tract and your liver. And it isn't a base of peanut oil. So if you have peanut allergies, don't use it. But those are a couple of wonderful options. A, a progesterone trochee does have to be made in a compounding pharmacy and the out-of-pocket cost is greater, but it seems to be better tolerated. And I like it because you can really, um, you can score it into smaller pieces and really do less the first half of your cycle, more the second half of your cycle when you're more insulin resistant. So there's a lot of ways to skin the cat here. <laughs> what about protein? You mentioned protein earlier, mm -hmm. and I feel I've been learning more and more and more that women are just under protein. What do you think about that? They are. And all of you need to follow our girl, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. I was going to say, yeah, Hello. I was going to quote her. <laughs> oh, please. She, she's yeah, the she's, muscle is the organ of longevity. That is my favorite Gabrielle quote, but she and I've gone back and forth on like protein research papers. And, you know, um, there is so much research that shows not only do we need, you know, more protein than we're given overall, uh, or then we're advised to. The RDA, by the way, advises like 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. That works out for the average adult for like 60, maybe 80 grams of protein. And to give you perspective on how little that is, that's what I have my dialysis patients eating in the hospital. So the real recommendations, the better ones are one gram per ideal one gram per pound of ideal body weight, okay? Um, or, and if you're lifting heavy and if you're aging, it's actually like up to 1.2 grams per pound of ideal body weight. Now, so this works out to, in simple math, I won't take y'all through it, but it works out to like four to six ounces of protein three times a day and maybe spread out over a snack or two. So it is the most challenging macro for my clients to have. I joke, it's an abundance of riches, right? We, they're like, I can't eat enough for during the day and I lose weight. Why do we lose weight with protein? Because it sustains your blood sugar for four to six hours after you eat it, you don't crash. It also raises your serotonin and dopamine. So bye-bye cravings, bye-bye 3 p.m. crash and Starbucks and a brownie craving. It also helps you sleep better at night, right? And um, it helps you build lean muscle. If you're doing all the strength training and you're not eating enough protein, good luck building muscle, especially after menopause. It can be done, but man, it's a lot harder than when you're in your 20s and could like lift weights for a week and start looking cut. So protein is really, it reigns queen as your metabolic mistress. I definitely increased my protein. I want to say probably in the last year, I took it really seriously, uh, significantly increased. Now I, I do eat meat. I, so I get the predominance of my protein through meat. Um, we bought, um, half of a free range, uh, cow. And nice. so, um, I have meat all the time and in eggs and, you know, other things. And I have noticed a massive difference. I was, you know I was definitely under protein. I noticed that I believe it, I leaned up. Like it was easier for me to build muscle. I felt better. I have more energy and I just knew intuitively I needed more protein and mm -hmm. I was on the right track. I was definitely, I was having protein. Obviously I would, I was eating protein, whether it was plant-based or, um, animal-based, I was getting or even, you know, like protein shakes, um, I've since given up pretty much all protein shakes and just switched completely to um, meat protein. I was doing an experiment on myself to see if I noticed the difference and I noticed a huge difference. Now, I know not everyone feels that way and agrees that with that and that's completely, you know, okay. But when listening to Gabrielle Lyon and I was also listening to another wonderful educator, state, Dr. Stacey Sims, who's a um, PhD yes. women's health researcher out of New Zealand, who talks a lot about muscle and athletes and protein. And by athlete, she's talking about anyone who exercises, whether you're a professionally trained athlete or, you know, you just, you work out three to four times a week. And that's when I made the switch. Like, all right, I'm going to, for the next two months, I'm going to really increase my protein and see how I feel. And 
they were right. I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I needed more protein, especially in my forties and that's fine. So now I make sure to really hone in on my high levels of protein for me. Well, and also for you menstruating mamas out there, <clears throat> the yeah. second half of your cycle, there's like that couple days, right? Where your appetite ramps up and your blood sugar's kind of wonky and you're just really hungry. Those are the days to really double up on protein and not give into the Snickers cravings or face plant into, you know, a trough of ice cream, basically. Um, <laughs> but those are the times when you really want to double up on your protein and you won't gain weight premenstrually. Like you can really offset a lot of weight gain and sugar cravings. And yeah which yeah. is so nice. So, so nice. I will say I still, I'm a, I only do dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. I do 75 to 80% or higher. And so I still a hundred percent eat my chocolate, but oh, yeah. I added in my protein as well. Let's talk about alcohol. Cause that's a real hard one. That was another one when I was in practice where my patients in their forties go, what the hell? I used to have a glass of wine and feel fine. And now I'm a hot mess. Literally what what's going on with alcohol when we hit our yeah. 40s and 50s so you may find so about 30 percent of women when they go through perimenopause and menopause develop uh non-alcoholic fatty liver syndrome and that just makes it really hard even if you do have a fatty liver your body um i believe it's your alcohol dehydrogenase is the I, name yeah. of the yeah right your levels decrease which means your body metabolizes alcohol um much more poorly and it disrupts sleep. It will cause, you know, a blood sugar crash around 3 p.m. When your insulin drops, your cortisol goes up. So then you're wide awake and your liver's trying to detox and is like, I don't like this so much anymore. Um, and also, yeah, you can find that you're much more hungover the next day. So if hangovers are a problem and you want, and you're like, I just want, you know, a glass of wine at someone's wedding and I don't want to feel hungover, you know, some good old activated charcoal can do the trick. Um, that's a great way to, and you take it, you know, half an hour before you have a drink. It's a great way to, to help absorb it. But ultimately, yes, alcohol and caffeine, you will find you process them a lot less well once you hit perimenopause and menopause. And the problem with alcohol, the struggle with alcohol is the day after, like you're kind of dehydrated, so you actually look lighter and you may weigh less and you're like, woo, I got away with it. And then three days later, like you have your drink Saturday night and by Tuesday, you're like, yeah. what happened? Like I just put on three pounds and I'm bloated. Alcohol suppresses thyroid function for up to four days after one cocktail. And it does raise circulating estrogen levels for up to six hours after you drink it. So if you're on hormone replacement, certainly, or the pill, or, uh, you know, it, certainly use it judiciously, but it does prevent fat loss um, when you're drinking. So if you have a drink on Saturday night, right, it's going to take your body till Tuesday to even start recover. You get like four good days of working out, and then you have another cocktail on Saturday night. It's kind of a vicious cycle. And it, it is a mindset shift for sure. I've cut way back on my drinking. I mean, I'm always in a cocktail state of mind. Don't get me wrong. I'm like, <laughs> like my mind is like martinis and my body's like lavender. So <laughs> and my mind's like, no, no, you really want that martini. But my body's like, you're going to hate yourself tomorrow and have a crap night's sleep. So don't go there. So you start to, the trade-off is, right? Yes, you're going to watch your friends have a great time and they're going to dance like a little extra wild, you know, that Saturday night. But the next morning, you're going to be the one up at six, having not derailed your eating. You're not like getting cravings or you're not saying, well, it's okay. Like your inhibitions won't drop and you're not going to have that late night piece of pizza at midnight. So you will be more virtuous. You will be better rested. And you will also find your irritability decreases. You know, alcohol, what really prompted me to cut back was like, I was being a total a-hole to my family the night after a drink. And I was like, you know what? I don't like myself. I don't want to be that woman. Um, so I, I cut way back and, and my liver's just so much happier because of it. And I have great energy and I'm just really a lot more consistent with my eating and workouts. And I do want to put the disclaimer in there too, because I get this pushback. Um, I get two, two kinds of pushback. One is, well, Carrie, I only do um, vodka in mm -hmm. soda water or Carrie, I only do tequila uh, on the rocks and it doesn't affect my blood sugar at all. I'm like, that's fantastic. It doesn't affect your blood sugar. Still alcohol. You still have to process it through your liver. And the second pushback I get is, well, Carrie, I only drink organic biodynamic low sugar wine. I'm like, fantastic. Wonderful. Same. 
still alcohol. <laughs> like, if you still wake up and you feel kind of crappy and you didn't sleep great and you've got any kind of tracker on your body, an Apple watch, an aura ring, a whoop bracelet that says everything is plummeted through the night and you feel puffy a couple days later, you that's you trying to process that alcohol. I'm glad your blood sugar stayed stable. Fantastic. Yes. Well, the rest of it didn't. <laughs> yes. And I mean, listen, I do have clients that lose weight while drinking. Um, they've usually been men, um, number one, and the women are literally working out two hours a day and their diet is like super low carb and they're dialed in. Um, but again, that works much better in your younger years. Once you hit menopause, that's really hard to maintain that. So it is possible. And if you can have a cocktail or two and lose body fat, more power to you. That means, you know, you're in great shape, but for the rest of us, if you're really struggling and you notice that's the one thing, then yeah, give it, I mean, give it 30 to 60 days and be like, let me measure my body fat before, during, and after you will see a difference. It's really hard to not see a result when you take it out. Yeah. A friend of mine just put on social media. I want to say like a month ago, she gave up wine. She lives in wine region out here and she was having a glass of wine every night and she gave up wine. And after a month, she was like, holy crap, my breast tenderness went away. My anxiety went way down. I lost an inch or two around the waist. My sleep is a 10 times better. She's like, I didn't realize just at one glass of social, right? She was like, it was enjoyable. It was family dinner. It was wine down. It was, it was, um, it brought joy in a lot of other ways, oxytocin and bonding and everything. But she said, I think she's 47 or 48. And she was like, the rest of my metabolic markers were clearly a hot mess. And I didn't like who I was becoming physically and from the inside out. Um, and so realized that after 30 days of no alcohol. Yes. And there are amazing substitutes, right? Oh, and alcohol. Also, if you're trying to heal your gut, like, please do not yes. drink alcohol. That is just going to take you down hard. But okay. There's a, uh, there's a product I found. It's a company called Wiley Women, W-I-L-E. I don't have any financial ties. They make one called Unangry. <laughs> and it's like a lavender tonic. And I put that in my water at night. There's another one called, um, oh my gosh, we're going to have to put this in the show notes. My memory. It's Rock, it's Rock Grace. That's it. That's you sent that to, you sent me that name to me before. Yes. And yes. that they, it looks like it's in a wine bottle and they have like um, rose water, you know, with infused with crystals. It just tastes really pleasant. And, you know, it comes in a wine. It looks like a wine bottle or, you know, just some good old fashioned kombucha or aqua kefir or, you know, there's so many substitutes out there and it, you know, when you're ordering in a restaurant, right. You know, you, it doesn't have to be a story in our head. Like, Oh, I can't drink. It's like, Nope, I don't drink, or I'm not drinking. Let me get a club soda. And then it's over, right. That minute pauses. And then everyone's back to socializing and not worrying about you. So that's another good, you know, little mental hack there. Those are good. Those are so helpful. My gosh. I want to touch on just the last thing is our gut health. Um, you, We've been talking about it throughout the podcast, how it can change as we go into perimenopause and menopause. So how do you direct women who are listening and saying, yeah, my gut's kind of a mess, gas, bloating, mm -hmm. constipation, mm -hmm. or heartburn or whatever as I've gotten older. What do you do for that? How do you yeah. look that up? Well, so first I remove any pathogens or parasites that should not be there. Um, you know, H. pylori, I just did a post that said, is, is H. pylori the new STD? Because like H. pylori, it's really, it's ubiquitous. I mean, it's so prevalent. You can get it kissing your partner. I read this crazy graphic article. I swear it should have been on like a porn site, but it was all about like anal sex versus oral sex and this. And can you pass H. pylori that way? And yeah, you kind of can. Although I don't know how much it lives in lower canals. Right, lower, upper, yeah. But I'm like, okay. But it was fun research. Um, but yeah, so H. pylori is something you definitely want to clean out if it, and you do need to treat you and your partner ideally because it does, it can cause reflux, it can cause ulcers, it can cause all sorts of havoc and it shuts down the production of stomach acid. And you want stomach acid. Stomach acid is a giant firewall that keeps out H. pylori and keeps out pathogens and parasites. And we're coming up on, uh, you know, warmer weather in a lot of places. And that's when E. coli presents itself on your spinach, on your strawberries. So 
you get a, I, my goal is to, to clear out the pathogens, replenish hydrochloric acid, replenish healthy bacteria. And I do this through supplements, through diet. Um, you know, the, my, the gut microbiome really likes diversity. It really does. And, you know, we get very stuck eating the same things now because you can get berries in December, even in the Northeast, you get berries in December, you get avocados and, and mangoes and all these foods that used to only be seasonal. So you got to remember to rotate up your food cooked versus raw. You know, if you're super bloaty, stick to more cooked vegetables. You can try low FODMAP vegetables for a little while to just give you some relief. Soups and stews are great. Um, but if you, if you tolerate raw vegetables, certainly, I mean, wash all your produce well, buy organic as much as possible, um, and, and really make sure you're getting a lot of protein to heal your gut. And I'd be very mindful of grains and dairy. If you're really trying to heal your gut, they just tend to cause a lot of inflammation and, you know, uh, and also immune system reactivity. And what I really have seen in my patients is you know, we, we cut out the funky bacteria. I'm thinking now of my one client who has like uh, autoimmune conditions, she's young and not menopausal yet, but was having just horrible wrist pain and like couldn't lift weights because of her wrist and really, really achy and couldn't digest anything. So we cleaned out her diet, no grains or dairy. She wasn't even eating a lot of animal protein when she first came to me. So we cleaned up her gut and she started having like solid bowel movements a day instead of like painful gas and blowing constipation. She started having solid bowel movements. Her joint pain went away. She has now reintroduced foods. She's eating like legumes, like lentils, which for her was just a hard no. She had some gluten and grain exposures and was okay. And that's, and dairy too. And that's what I want for my people is to just get a normal life back and not be on a restricted diet their whole lives. So right. first I weed right? Pull out pathogens and parasites and funky bacterial overgrowth like staph and uh, all these other not nice bugs, pseudomonas, not nice bugs. Then um, I heal the inflammation. I put in a lot of slippery mucilaginous herbs like, uh, uh, well, glutamine is very helpful, but the slippery ones are marshmallow root, um, slippery elm, okra. You can, you can eat okra too, um, and those help restore the nice mucosal lining in the gut because the mucosal lining really takes a nosedive when estrogen and progesterone decline as well. So it helps rebuild that lining and then throw in some digestive fire and take build up to taking hydrochloric acid, which you should not take with an active H. pylori infection, but you slowly reintroduce um, you know, a uh, good acid that acts as a firewall and is very protective. And what happens over time is, lo and behold, you start absorbing your nutrients. You poop every day, your bloating goes down, your sleep improves, you have more energy, you clear out your brain fog. So candida is part of that picture too. I do, you know, clean out candida or SIBO. And I should mention, you know, a lot of people will come to me, Carrie, and say, I have, sand I have SIBO and I have candida. That's not a primary diagnosis. That's actually a secondary diagnosis. So you want to think about what are the conditions that are allowing your body to grow these species in the first place. And that's where you get to the root cause of the problem. Not everyone I treat has pathogens or parasites. Some people just have really low stomach acid due to chronic stress and have like very low levels of beneficial bacteria. So sometimes I'm just pouring in the good stuff and there's nothing to clean out. So that goes back to your meditation, right? If you want to heal your gut, you better start <laughs> chilling out a little bit because chronic stress shuts off the production of hydrochloric acid. If you're in a fight or flight state, your body is not going to digest your food. It's like, nope, I got to get up and run potentially. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not time interested. For this. <laughs> I don't have time for this. I have no interest. So yeah, that's how we treat it. Some of the listeners might know SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, S-I-B-O. That's what SIBO yes. is. Yes, 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 yes. Oh my goodness. This has been a wealth of information. Well, <laughs> because this is the Root Cause Medicine podcast, we are all about practical and tactical. What would you like to leave the listeners with? Like one or two things that you're like, take this home, implement this tomorrow. Let's make this worthwhile. Mm, that is such a great question. Okay. Um, 
first and foremost, lifestyle above all. <clears throat> okay, so make sure again, I, I would put yourself on a challenge to, to meditate or manage your stress or just put your phone away at night. You know, really make this about you time. Okay. Number two is start optimizing your protein intake now. Do it now because muscle loss creeps up slowly and then all of a sudden it hits. Like you will notice a big change in your body. And I lift weights and eat protein and I notice some changes in my body and I'm like, ooh, okay, better keep up in that, you know? So um, absolutely do that. And third is work with a good functional medicine practitioner. Get your testing done. You can start in perimenopause. You can start potentially replenishing hormones or at least getting herbs in there to get your progesterone up to, um, to offset estrogen. If your progesterone is really taking a nosedive, you will be relatively estrogen dominant. And really that is a, a tough place to be. Breast tenderness and blood clots and irritability and weight gain. So make sure that your progesterone is up and, um, I love uh, ifm.org. That's the Institute for Functional Medicine.org lists functional medicine and make sure you work with an MD or a DO, which is Doctor of Osteopathy. Or ND. Um, or M yes, or well, ND, ND. Okay, so forgive me for dissing <laughs> NDs. Not all of them have prescription privileges that is true. depending on what true. state you're in. So you're depending right. on the state, I would love for everyone to work with an ND, but I often refer elsewhere because I, I live in Connecticut and you can't get a prescription right, right. written here to save your life. So not, I love an, um, my ND. So yes, <laughs> work with a practitioner. You know, I'm a functional medicine dietitian. There are lots of us out there also running these amazing tests. Just work with someone legit not an Instagram influencer, <laughs> please, <laughs> for God's sake, please. Right. This is your health, your labs, your <laughs> life we're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. Invest intelligently. Do your due diligence. Make sure, you know, there's certifications, there's licensure, interview people's success stories, interview clients, you know, say, who else have you worked with? Can I talk to any of your patients or clients? You know, like really do your research on who you interview. I love it. I love it. Well, for people who want to learn more around you, Yay. your upcoming book, your prior books, tell us all the things. Yes. Okay. So see you later. Ovulator comes out 10 4, which I love that release date, like over and out. <laughs> um, you can go to, I'm on Instagram at gorgeous Esther. And uh, my website is estherblum.com. Definitely get on my newsletter because I'm going to do a lot of announcements. We're going to do some giveaways down the line. And um, yeah, just what a great privilege to be here, Carrie. I mean, seriously, so fun. So, oh, so, so fun. I so. could talk to you all day long. I just <laughs> really appreciate you taking the time because like we said in the very beginning, women just don't get the information they need around perimenopause and menopause. Or as you said, right from the get-go, the gaslighting is high. And I love to be able to talk to you about this too debunk these myths and really set women on a path to be their own self-advocate. So thank you. You are so welcome. Thank you.